We have known for many years that cities can create their own microclimate, where meteorological parameters such as temperature, humidity or wind may be significantly different than in the surrounding areas. The city of Paris, for example, is on average 3 degrees hotter than its surroundings, but the difference can reach 10 or 12 degrees Celsius during heat waves, with dire consequences on the city's energy consumption and especially on the well-being and health of its inhabitants. In fact, excessive heat is the extreme weather phenomenon that causes the most deaths. This difference in temperature between a city and its surrounding areas is called the urban heat island effect. In this video, we will see what causes this phenomenon, but first, let's review some weather and climate fundamentals that will allow us to understand things better. So let's start by reminding ourselves that the air in the atmosphere is not heated directly by the sun, but mainly absorbs the heat that is radiating from the Earth's surface. This is because the gases that make up the atmosphere are not able, at least for the most part, to directly absorb the solar energy carried by the sun's rays. Thus, the solar energy entering our atmosphere can travel through it until it reaches the Earth's surface. Once at the surface, some of this energy is reflected back to space, but most of it is absorbed by the surface and transformed into heat. As the surface warms up, it can in turn heat the air above it, in part because a thin layer of air in contact with the hot surface can heat up and then rise and distribute this heat into the atmosphere, but mainly because the more a surface heats up, the more it radiates heat to its surroundings in the form of infrared radiation. Unlike most of the solar radiation, infrared radiation can be absorbed and transformed into heat by the gases in the atmosphere, and this is what makes the air temperature rise. However, not all of the solar energy absorbed by the surface goes to increasing its temperature. A small fraction is never transformed into heat, but is used directly by plants for photosynthesis. Moreover, a potentially large part of the solar energy is used for water evaporation in oceans, lakes, but also from the ground and in the biosphere. Indeed, water molecules need a lot of energy to be transformed into water vapor. When vapor rises into the atmosphere, the energy used for evaporation is transferred from the surface to the atmosphere, which cools the surface. But because it is stored in the vapor molecules as potential energy and not as thermal energy, it does not increase the temperature of the air. Now let's compare what happens when the solar energy arrives in a rural area or in an urban area. On average, both have more or less the same albedo, that is to say, they will reflect or, on the contrary, absorb more or less the same amount of energy. There is nevertheless an important difference. In the rural area, there are many vegetated surfaces where water can infiltrate into the soil or be absorbed by plants. A large part of the solar energy is therefore used for evapotranspiration. This causes the surface to cool considerably, or, more correctly, causes the surface to warm less than if there were no evaporation. On the contrary, in the city vegetation is scarce and the ground is mostly covered by impermeable surfaces. Rainwater is often quickly channeled into drains and immediately evacuated, which means that cities contain a lot less water than rural areas. Thus, almost all the solar energy can be used to increase the surface temperature, because very little is used for evapotranspiration. This means that throughout the day the surfaces and therefore the air in the city heat up much more than the countryside. But that is not all. When the sun goes down, the surfaces stop receiving solar energy, but as long as they stay warm, they continue to radiate the heat they have stored during the day. In the countryside, this radiation can escape relatively quickly, so that at night, the surfaces and the air cool down quite quickly. In the city, this takes a lot more time. Firstly, because the surfaces have stored more heat and are warmer, so it takes longer to cool down. And secondly, because the buildings can form what are called urban canyons, in which the radiation can remain trapped for longer, because the surfaces reflect the heat back to each other. It is therefore often at night that the urban heat island effect is the most noticeable. In addition to trapping heat, buildings in urban areas can also create obstacles to air circulation, and in particular deflect or at least slow down wind that could otherwise come to cool the air. 
Finally, we must not forget that human activity, which is concentrated in urban and suburban areas, generates heat in itself. Among the things that generate the most heat are heating and air conditioning of buildings. Indeed, put simply, the very principle of air conditioning is to take heat from inside a room and throw it outside. This creates a vicious circle, because the hotter the air in the city is, the more people crank up their air conditioning systems, and this produces additional heat. Traffic and industrial activities can also contribute to warming of urban areas, but to a lesser extent, especially because often industrial activities are not located right in the city centers. There is also a very complex relationship between heat islands and air pollution. Several studies show quite clearly that the heat island effect contributes to increased air pollution in urban areas. This is mainly for two reasons. Firstly, because the heat facilitates the production of certain pollutants. And secondly, because like all warm air, the air in the heat island will tend to rise and this can draw in polluted air from the industrial areas around the city centre. It is much less clear whether an increase in pollution can increase the heat island effect. This is because while pollutant can contribute to trapping heat and thus make the city warmer, they can also block some of the sun's radiation, which will instead lower temperatures. One last thing which may be worth mentioning explicitly is that urban heat islands are not directly related to the increase in greenhouse gases and global warming. Indeed, their existence precedes global warming by several decades. That said, it is also true that rising temperatures related to global warming make the effects of heat islands all the more problematic. For this reason, many cities are implementing strategies to mitigate the heat island effect by using clear, more reflective building material, which absorb less heat to start with, or by bringing more vegetation and water back into the city centers to take advantage of the cooling effect of evaporation. I hope you found this video interesting. If it is the case, please consider subscribing to our channel. I hope to see you soon for another video. Bye bye!